Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. Welcome back to the top 10 favorite paintings. This time it will be of P.A. Mondrian, but before you start watching, click subscribe. So P.A. Mondrian! What was that? Well, I'm sure once you see his most iconic paintings, you'll see who he was, but why do I have a Picasso painting behind me? One that I did, of course. Well, <laughs> you will find that eventually, but this is foreshadowing some of his influences in his work. So let's get started with the first painting. And this first painting of Pierre Mondrian was one of his earlier works that was painted in the year 1990. And the reason I like this painting is because... 1990? 1890? <laughs> or, or... 1900! What? No, 1900! This, this painting was painting... Ah! <laughs> this painting was painted in 1900. And the reason I like this painting is because, you know, he's young, has hopeful look about himself his eyes are bright eyed like he can take on the world you know when you're young and you think you can do anything and you're just full of life he looks like ryan gosling ryan gosling you were right yeah. yeah but anyway at his early age and even throughout his career he admired the work of rembrandt and he wanted to become a respected artist like Rembrandt was, but he had one major problem. He said that he was psychologically unstable. But anyway, Mondrian um, was born in March 7th, 1871, and he died on February 1st, 1944 from pneumonia. Really? Yeah, he was very poor. He grew up being very poor, and then his father was uh, in the Protestant church. So his father would travel, you know, in service of the church and really never supported the family. Or so the mother was always sick, and kind of the person in charge of their household was their sister, Joanna. Christina when she was only eight years old. What? That's crazy. Yeah, so he he grew up in extreme string poverty. And if you look at this painting, his clothes look worn, but his hair looks good. So I guess they had enough for hair gel. <laughs> <laughs> Why he just painted it good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Painting number painting two. Painting number two is titled Meal in Sunlight, the Winkle Meal, painted in 1908. And the reason why I like this because when I was going to art school, even after art school, like I've had a lot of people tell me, well, you need to mix your colors more. You're just using I'm straight from the tube and you're not supposed to do that and I was thought why can't I use it right out of the tube they've made it then why can't I use it and this painting that he created he used the paint right out of the tube the red the orange all those colors are just squeezed out in use and if Mondrian can do that you can do I it I can use this color straight out of the tube without mixing them if I need a teal green I can buy a teal green and use it and I have to make it <laughs> so that's why I like this painting but in this painting you can already begin to see that He's uh, taking inspiration from Van Gogh. Yeah, definitely. The way the application of paint he's doing and just the color usage. I cannot wait. Is this one of another painters that never realized how famous they become and he dies poor? You'll see. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so painting number three is titled Woods Near O.L. or O.E.L. I don't know, but it's painted in 1908. And this painting references Starry Night. Really? The movement in the trees and the branches. It's kind of the same looseness that mm, inspired. But nowhere as good. Yeah, yes. nowhere as good, but inspired by Starry Night. And if you can see the bottom of this painting, you see this looseness in the night, in the of the lines. He also specifically let the canvas show in this painting mm -hmm. to reference Starry Night and those areas in the painting which you can see the canvas. So next painting, Passion Flower, 1901. That's beautiful. The reason why I like this one is because it's so different from any of the other of his other works that he's done or that he's known for. I think the way the woman is positioned is a little bit awkward, but the, how <clears throat> the background is done and those flowers, it adds balance and it's peaceful to look at. I don't know, I don't like her neck, but I like the detail of her face. Yeah, it's a little awkward position because if you is. go like this, Nobody's gonna like that name. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I know that you don't, but I like paintings with text, so I like it. Even though it's small text. And I love those flowers. I like how symmetrical it is. Yeah, I like very it. Very beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. And very unusual for his work. Who is the girl? Do we know? Uh, I have no idea who she is. Oh, okay. Now the next painting is red amaryls with blue background. Wow. It's again color straight out of the tube, which I, they make the color, use it. But the reason why I chose this one and it's why it's on the list is because sometimes as an artist, I want to paint things and I paint them because they inspire me and they never sell because it just doesn't appeal to a wider audience. Yeah. And Mondrian caught onto that fairly quickly. So he would make these type of paintings to please the audience and to have kind of have money a, have money and have a marketable side of his art that he could live off of even though it was you know not excessive but he so made these he, flower paintings okay. because they were popular and the 
people would buy them. Flowers were something that people wanted to have in their house. Yeah, well, I guess we all do that at some point of our lives. Yep. <laughs> so, in 1911, he decides, you know what, I'm done with living here, and he moves to Paris. Uh -huh. Because in Paris, at this time, Picasso's there, Barack is there, Oopsie. and the whole Cubism movement is going on. He moves to Paris, and he starts painting like Picasso and Barack and the Cubists, where they're using a lot of harsh black lines, a lot of muted colors, browns and grays and things of that nature. So basically he is Mimicking like... and copying their style. Okay, so Van Gogh didn't work for me, now let me copy Picasso. Yeah, let me copy Picasso and that's how he started, you know, the whole Cubist thing and the Cubist skill, even using the same colors. But this next yeah. one on my list... I like on, it though. It's on my list because he starts leaving Picasso and Broad. He starts employing the pinks, the yellow and the blue, which are primary colors and it's almost going in that phase that uh, Mondrian is known for. Mm -hmm. So all of these paintings that are cheap replicas of Picasso and Barack, I don't like. But this one I like because it's starting to shift in his head and he's starting to kind of create his own thing based off of that inspiration. Yeah. You know, like with me, I, I've referenced a lot of other artists, but I feel like I now have my own style. But it, it happened by me mimicking those artists who I admired. So that's why I like this one and that's and why I it's think, really good. And I think that Salvador Dali or somebody said that we all like steal from somebody. Didn't he say something yeah, that there was said nothing that original All anymore? artists are thieves. Yeah. But the good ones, you don't know who they're stealing from. I don't know, yeah. I, I remember there's a... If, well, anyway, this painting is supposed to be a church facade, so it doesn't look like the facade of a church, does it? Nope. It looks like lines and squares, but he, he was inspired by the church facade because he wanted to express how it, it ascends yeah. gradually. And if you look at the painting, you almost look like these lines are in movement and they are progressively ascending and that's another thing that he wanted to incorporate and wanted his viewer to get the idea of motion throughout his painting. Mm -hmm. Also, um, this is where he starts getting involved in art architecture and the aesthetics of architecture. So the next painting is Rose in Glass. And like I said before, he painted a large number of paintings with flowers. Mm -hmm. But he thought, he said that the flower represented the missing woman in his life. Oh, I yeah. love him. He was never... He never got married. He never got married. No, ever. never? But what he did, he just hopped on the uh, painting for decoration trend that was going on at, at that time. Mm -hmm. But I like this one too because it, it kind of reminds me of the paintings that Warhol did. Mm -hmm. Well, not paintings, the prints that Warhol did of Marilyn. Yeah. Where it's just the face and then everything else is gold around it. Yeah, I like it. So I don't know if Warhol referenced Mondrian, but I, I picked that because of that. I like it. Is it watercolor? No, it's oil. It's not watercolor. I think. Oh. <laughs> so the next one is what you know Mondrian for. It's called Composition with Red, Black, Blue, and Yellow, painted in 1928. Mm -hmm. At this point, um, Mondrian had surpassed the Cubist. He was now becoming a modern painter, so he, he came to this stating his career, having gone through Picasso and Brox and being inspired and literally copying their work, he found his own way and own expression through art, which was basically removing and redefining art to its very minimal aspect, which is line and shape. Everything in art can be reduced down to line and shape. How old was he? In 1928. Well, he was born in 1872. So, let's do a little... Like 50 something. And the reason he did these, like I said, it was because we're going back to the basis of color, which is the primary colors and then line. And he thought that outlining everything in black brought boldness to the color. And I do that a lot. And I tell my kids when I teach them, trace it in black so it looks better. And that's what he did. He would out basically outline these shapes in black to make their boldness be more prominent. So guys, I went to make the calculation how old he was and he was 56 when he did this that is his most recognizable art. This was in the 1928. I mean, think about being in that era and painting this. Isn't there some of these at the MoMA? Because I remember yeah, yeah. seeing some like that. During the MoMA. And I thought, oh my God, this guy has no skill, but it's so interesting to see that he did have more complicated things and the most basic stuff is what made him famous. Unique. But you know, this, this most basic stuff, you think it would have been easy to come up with. And it took him a whole process a of whole years process. to come up with this. Crazy. Isn't that crazy? And yeah. But, and but, it gives us 
hope uh, if you're in your late 20s, 30s, 40s, look at this guy, yeah. he made it at 56. You keep trying and trying and like don't feel bad because you're emulating other people's style or because you're finding inspiration in other people's work because all of that is going to lead you to where you need to be. That's crazy. And this was so influential that, you know, there's been houses inspired by this, mm -hmm. buildings inspired. The designer Yves Saint Laurent created the Mondrian dress, which was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. um, there's been furniture, there's jewelry, there's a whole lot of things in our day-to-day -day life that have been inspired by these paintings. What is valued when he was alive? Please tell me. Uh, I have no idea how much this was that cost. No, 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 time. like, did he know the people start saying, hey, I like this? Yes, yes, at this point he had uh, started becoming famous. Okay, good. Things like that. Good. Um, they were already constructing architecture based off of these. And they looked very simple, but the paint was very layered and very caked. And he get frustrated that they weren't drying fast enough, and he used some type of petroleum-based liquid mm -hmm. to make it dry faster, and it doesn't help in preserving them. So now I'll, if you look at them... They're cracked. They cracked and they're very brittle. Mm. But anyway, that's the iconic Mondrian, and that led him to composition two with black lines painted in 1930. <laughs> Even more basic. So at this point, he has removed all color and then just Ooh, it. <laughs> left the lines. And That's then he crazy. he actually believed that his whole process of painting was going to get them to the point where it was going to be impossible for him to paint. Really? Because he had developed, he had experimented throughout his career in various ways and techniques. And he had come to what he had wanted in terms of modern art, but he kept uh, he added all he could and then he took away and then he thought at some point It's gonna be a blank thing. Yeah, I won't be able to do this anymore But something special happened and this is why I wonder why he never really had a relationship <gasps> What happened? Tell me a young artist by the name of Harry Holtzman and then the reading I did grabs him as being very handsome and Why would they say that he was handsome? Trouble. Trouble. He reached out to them and told him hey you should come to New York It's a great city this that and the other and he kind of considered it but never really had had the guts to do it but apparently where he lived there was a, a bomb that was close to or in the building he lived in so 1940 he makes a move to New York he meets Harry Holtzman and after he meets Harry Holtzman takes his brother off of his wheel he disinherits his brother and lives his whole estate to this guy oh my holy guacamole the book doesn't say that there was a relationship with him but there was a lot of money involved <laughs> I don't know how much of the money was involved, but for you to disinherit your own family and give it to an unknown person, there must At least be it. Some, si some sort of feelings attached or involved. Wow. So once he moved to New York, he was re-inspired by New York City, the life of New York City, and maybe by Harry Holtzman, who knows. And he painted this painting, which is the last one on my list, titled Broadway Boogie Woogie 1942-1943. Uh, are there any pictures of them together? No, there aren't any pictures of them. But if you look at this painting, it kind of reminds me of like the lights on the Broadway signs. Yeah. And he wanted his paintings to show movement. And this one to me shows a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. So when they thought that he was, you know, not going to be able to be inspired again, but New York brought that inspiration to him. He was there for years and he died in 1944, I believe, mm -hmm. in New York City. But what's great about Mondrian is that while he was there, Peggy Guggenheim, Mm -hmm. which is the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Mm -hmm. She was one of the main collectors, so she spent a lot of time with uh, Mondrian. One of the times that Mondrian went to visit her, she showed him a Jackson Pollock painting. And at this point, Peggy Guggenheim was kind of like not liking Pollock's work and things like that. So then Mondrian saw it and he said, this is the most exciting painting that I have seen in a while. So because of that, Peggy Guggenheim kind of kept investing in Jackson Pollock. So it said that Mondrian kind of, yeah, but he's responsible for the discovery of Jackson Pollock and is accredited for the movement of abstract expressionism. So isn't that cool that he started way, he started in such a way that it's so far from where he ended. And it was a, a really a journey for him artistically because all these paintings kind of are different from each other, but they kind of have something of the other in them. Like the early ones have those true blue colors right out of the tube that that's kind of the color that you see now. At the end, yeah. It's like, it's a mix of the simplicity of, I think it's, it's all so basic, but beautiful and unique. And now that I see it now, and I know the journey of what it was to bring him to this painting makes it even more significant to me. And to him, I guess, and anyone who is a uh, fan of Mondrian's work. So you should never get discouraged if you're attempting different things and they don't work or they don't work or you keep not succeeding in what you're doing because all of this is a journey. It's 
part of your quest of taking you where you ultimately will end up and where you ultimately need to be. So just keep your head up, push stay strong, through. push through and keep creating. And when you have your little doubts and feeling blue, just think about Mondrian's path to success. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I hope you like this video. It's very uh, inspirational. Tell me what you think about Mondrian's work. Tell me which was your favorite one. Did I leave something out? And please watch the rest of my videos. I have more videos uh, concerning my top 10 favorite paintings from different artists. Uh, and well, anyway, um, subscribe. Subscribe. Adios y bye.